I'm just going to start this podcast uh, in a different way than usual because I feel in a different way than usual. I'll tell you all about it right after this. Well, 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 what do we have here? This strange tone of voice that's not perky and podcast hosty like usual. Um, maybe because I'm not feeling perky and podcast hosty like usual. Um, it's Sunday. Let's have a look at the date here. It's Sunday, August 23rd, 2020. And uh, it's a funky day. Sometimes I try and blame blame the weather that it's a funky day um, because in England you can do that really easily because the odds are the weather is not going to be good. So you can blame the weather, blame the clouds. But I'm in California and the weather's frankly awesome. So uh, it's a little bit hard to blame the weather here. I'm also staring at the most awesome California view palm trees, tons of palm trees, nice blue sky. And, and that just makes me feel even more guilty that how dare I feel funky. Um, how dare I feel nothing but complete unwavering gratitude uh, for being able to look out of my windows and see blue sky and palm trees. So um, I thought we'd just talk a little about being funky today and why I feel funky and uh, see how you guys are doing uh, since we're several months now, what feels like months into the global pandemic. Um, certainly, I would say in my life, I don't think I've known the world to have so much uncertainty and I feel it etching into my psyche, this uncertainty. I feel it from other people. Uh, when I brave it out to go to the grocery stores and there's just this like tension and I can feel people worrying about things, which I don't blame them. You know, uh, you might be worrying about things. Um, maybe you're feeling like a statistic because you've lost your job or maybe you haven't lost your job. So you're feeling guilty because a lot of people have lost their jobs. Um, I uh, actually, I not to blame Jessa, but I'm totally going to blame my uh, lovely colleague and fellow podcaster, Jessa Reed, because I just happened to tune into one of her podcasts. I hadn't listened to her for a while. And the thing that Jessa Reed and I have in common is we both had near-death experiences that were extremely life-changing. And mine was 2012, 2012, February 2012. And it was at the time, it just changed everything for me. Uh, if you've listened to this podcast before, you've heard me speak about what happened. If you haven't listened to the podcast before, just check out. I have a page that just in a nutshell describes what happened to me. Uh, February 2012, uh, blood pressure crashed, went icy cold. Um, took a while to figure out I'd had a near-death experience. I think everybody present thought I had food poisoning for a bit. And then I started to speak scientific information. And um, then I spent the next 16 months researching the scientific information only to find that everything I'd said was exactly true. And I've since had a lot of podcasts, uh, I've since had a lot of um, scientists on the podcast. See, so even my brain's a little fumbly today. And you know why that is? It's trauma. Trauma scrambles your brain. And I have had so much trauma over the past few months. And I've learned what it is to be re-traumatized. I've got official PTSD, um, which is strange. Um, it's not the first time I've had PTSD. So this is a re-traumatization of a time that I was diagnosed with PTSD. And what I've learned about re-traumatization is that it can happen on a dime. 
if something just reminds you of a traumatic thing that happened in your life. And um, that's what's happened to me is I got re-traumatized last year. And man, has it sucked. It has been brutal. And horribly as well, the PTSD was even at a heightened power than it was when the original incident and then the trauma of the aftermath of the incident occurred many, many years ago. Um, it has sucked big time. I've had a stutter for one. Um, here I am, somebody who's always been comfortable speaking. I've been a performer now since I was like 12 years old. And uh, I've had a stutter and I have had what they call myoclonic movements, which is where your body moves and there's not particularly a reason why, but what what's going on is stuff in your brain and your brain perceives a threat. And so it can jolt your body. And for me, it's been like, I've had little electrocutions going on and my body has just jolted and it was really bad. It's uh, dying off now uh, a little bit, um, but it's just been horrible. Uh, it's been awful for my partner as well that I have lived with, who's been so patient with me. Um, he's had to change everything about he, how he exists so that he doesn't trigger all these strange things that have been happening to me. Um, like I've been really sound sensitive. I've been light sensitive. Things like a potato chip bag to me sound like deafening, like awful, awful sounds. And then the strange thing is though, things that would normally be annoying, like somebody's leaf blower or a lawnmower, those are not causing a reaction with me. It's all been very, very strange. White lights bother me big time. Um, it's, we thought that I had a, like a concussion and then when my symptoms didn't go away from the concussion from a little car accident in 2018, then I was sent to some specialists who were like, oh, you have PTSD. That's what you've got. Um, and then things started to make a lot more sense. And then another re-traumatization happened. And that just was like PTSD on top of PTSD. And that's when the stuttering and the shaking started. And uh, frankly, I've felt like an incredibly fragile human being. Um, the pandemic is an excellent excuse not to leave the house because I'm pretty comfortable not leaving the house. Uh, the only thing that's bad is that I was getting a lot of treatment for the PTSD and it was fantastic. I gotta say, oh boy, oh boy. If you've never had cupping, it's literally one of the favorite things I've ever had. I think people first heard about cupping when Gwyneth Paltrow posted some pictures of her uh, with little cups on her back years ago. And it definitely looked pretty hocus pocus. And I'm the first one to say I did not think that there'd be anything to this stuff. But it is really, frankly, hocus pocus. It makes you believe in hocus pocus. So I go to the, or before the pandemic, I was going to this, uh, you know, acupuncture guy and he very casually was like, oh, I do cupping, I do cupping. And so he heats up these little glass jars and you lie on your front and it's like you're going to get a massage, but instead he drags these little glasses, like these little, like almost like shot glasses over your back. And he's heated the air with a little flame, which definitely makes it even more hocus pocusy. So you hear that like little shh of the match going, which uh, is very like, it's like you've got some voodoo going on in the room about you. And it's frankly very soothing to hear a match go shh. And he puts the little cups and they suck your skin up into them. And what happens is it draws the blood. It's pretty gross. It draws the blood into this like bulge inside of the glass. And he, then he artfully moves the little cups around your back. And the first time I had it done, I came home and I looked at my back in the mirror and it looked like I'd had just literally some terrible beating on my back. It was awful. But here's the neat thing. 
the doctor said to me, oh, um, you know, it gets the toxins out of your body. And I thought, oh, this is like those little foot pouches. Who hasn't been suckered into buying those little foot pouch things and you you put them in the water or you strap them on on your feet and they go black and it's supposed to be all the toxins, it's, except it keeps on going black. Like you could put it on a baby's foot and it would go black. Um, so I, I thought, oh, this is like, this is some hocus pocus. But then I went back for more cupping because it was incredibly relaxing, which is great when you have a trauma, anything that relaxes you and stops that cortisol from pumping out into your body, like a flipping fire hose. Um, I even hate that. I just said flipping like that sounds, oh, I, I, I swear I've met people who've said flipping like the way that I just said it and it's really annoyed me. So I'm, I'm annoying myself right now. Anyway, I had the cupping done multiple times and what started to happen was less bruising was showing up, but he was still pressing hard and dragging the cups around. And I was like, wow. Like, and I said to him, why am I not getting the bruises now? And he's like, oh, the toxins are gone now. You just, you don't have much toxicity in your body. So there is something to the cupping. I definitely vouch for it now, but big time did it put me in a restful state. And I was having acupuncture for the PTSD, acupressure, and just all these things to help me relax and breathe and just feel calm and feel safe. And that's the biggie is I haven't really felt safe since this whole re-traumatization. And when you don't feel safe, you suddenly realize how incredibly precious and valuable it is to feel safe because I have not felt safe in my own skin. I've lived in this state of fear now for quite a long time since this re-traumatization and the PTSD diagnosis. And then the pandemic happened. Now that's just really what you want when you have PTSD and you already don't feel safe is the fear of bumping into a neighbor and catching a terrible disease. Um, it didn't bother me so much that it made me stay in the house because, of course, that's the safest I feel. Just stay indoors. Nothing can happen then, right? You just don't go out into the world. I'll just live like a hermit forever. That's how I've been feeling. Um, but, of course, because of COVID, I wasn't able to go out and get uh, acupressure and all my beautiful cupping and have my toxins sucked out and relax myself. Oh, I'm going to adjust this microphone. It might make a bump. And this is the other thing I'm, that's also come into being traumatized is this terribly like unbreakable perfectionism because it's this need to feel control over things and make things perfect. And we just can't make things perfect. And it's so hard. And that's why it keeps taking me such a long time as well to do a podcast, because I've realized that I want things to be perfect. And they just can't be and they're not right now. And how can anything in the world right now be perfect? It, it, it's just impossible. So all these little things I would think of like, oh, I'm going to have a sound glitch in my podcast. I can't put it out with a sound glitcher. It's got to be perfect. I've got to have my notes all perfect. I've, I've got to have everything perfect. Maybe there'll be an echo in the room. I'm in a different room than I used to be. And oh, to just let it go. And in this funky day today, I'm like, just going to sit and talk to you and <laughs> it's your choice if you listen. But if you do, I do have a little bit of cool stuff um, to share. A few months ago, I, I did a solo episode like this and I talked about depression and I got a lot of emails and a lot of comments from people uh, saying that the episode had really resonated with them and that uh, I'd read a poem which I titled my shitty poem which is um, really, really a perfect title when you've written a poem because you want to set the bar at the lowest point. So declaring that I wrote a shitty poem was really the only thing I could do to make myself comfortable to read the poem. So what I'm going to do after making this mic bump around, 
See, and, and maybe I won't even edit this bump out. Oh, this is getting pretty bumpy though. See, I'm, I'm trying to sit in a cozy place so that I feel nice and safe and comfy. I've got like little pillows behind me and I'm by the window looking at the palm tree. But the only thing is, is the microphone keeps slipping down. Um, but, but I've written another shitty poem and this one big time is about having depression. So I've got it all queued up for you guys. And my partner was like, you know, you should do another podcast on depression because you really know a lot about depression. And it's not like I'm depressed all the time. I'm really not. But boy, do I know what it feels like to be depressed. And I also know how vulnerable if you're that kind of a person who's like sensitive and fragile to depression, which a lot of artists are and creative people are, um, not to say other people aren't, but in my experience, I can tell you a hell of a lot of stand-up comedians struggle with depression. And you only need to have a, a quick Google of the incredible comedy minds we have lost to, uh, to suicide. I mean, Robin Williams and then Google Moore and there's, there's plenty and it's tragic. So there's something with people expressing themselves and feel, feeling that need to express themselves. I do think it tends to walk hand in hand with this vulnerability to um, depression. So my partner's like, well, you know, it's hard for me because I've never had depression and it's sometimes hard to know what it feels like to be you. And it's hard to, I don't know how I should be. And uh, so I've tried to sort of explain when you have a day, because it can come for, for a day. You can be struck with depression for a day. And I can only speak for myself because I only know how I feel, but I know that I have been struck with depression for a day like today. So anyway, back to my shitty poem. I think there's a uh, plane going over. That'll be perfect. I'm bumping the mic again. Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry. I'm bumping the mic. Oh, this is such like a comedy sketch going on here. I'm lifting the mic up and the whole mic stands like tilting down. So my whole neck and head is kind of following down. Okay, one big bump of the mic going up. Okay, there we go. That'll give it some droop time. All right. So I wrote this poem uh, last year, but today... I think it's an appropriate poem to share with you guys, and it's called In the Vine. In the vine as it pulls on my spine. Ah, oh, shoot, I'm going to start over again. The question is, will I edit that out? Oh, man, that's going to take some willpower to not, not edit that out. All right, I've got to also make sure I can see the words here. All right, let's try this again. In the vine, as it pulls on my spine, dragging me down where the bones all lie, trying to get me to say goodbye. In the vine, an unpredictable line, twisting my heart like a worn-out rag, my fingers tingle like they're pierced with a fragment of glass, a shard of the past that has travelled through time like a spear of memories from when I was fine. But here now I stagger and I drink too much wine, and there's only dissension, no hope of a climb. I'm pulled even further as I stand in the vine. Round my neck the hands grip, hands that aren't mine. Everywhere I look, all the same sign. It's time to surrender to the oily black vine. As my bones turn to chalk and tar fills my veins, I write my last words, surrender the reins. In the vine I'm existing and the vine goes so deep, like the roots of a pine round the worms with a creep. I'm about to allow its successful coercion, give up my breath to complete the immersion so that I am finally one with its root. But then my breath is still with me, won't life give me the boot? And the airs on my face, drying tears like lace, salty patchworks of pain. I've known them before and I'll know them again. But my shoulders relax and my belly expands. I'll do it tomorrow, for today, let it stand. And as hours turn to days and days into weeks, the lace fades away and there's only my cheeks, dormant and calm, lips heavy and still. But inside me a seedling, born from the ill world we live in, 
And now there's a bud, and then there's a flower where once there was blood, and I have understanding of how the bud came to be, nourished by the acid, a byproduct of me and the sins I've endured as the flower starts to bloom, I know I am cured. And this new point of view shows me the truth. The vine didn't want to kill me. It had to show me the proof of our true nature and how we're reborn, more refined and more perfect because we are torn. Like the couture gown stitched by tailors in Paris, more stitches to show the truest shape of the chalice, of the body that we don for this tour, and the cuts in our cloth, and we are couture. And on my chest an insignia, like a medal of honour, shaped like a vine, gripped tight upon a heart, like a wreath made of thorns, to keep open the wound, so as not to forget that pain is part of who we are. And when we think the vine's pulling us into the ground, and when we think the vine's pulling us into the ground, its root anchors us steady, so our self can be found. Yes, the vine has a root, like the tallest of trees, and when our leaves have all fallen, is when we are free. When we think we can't lift our heads and stand tall, is when the vine's roots have run so deep that we will not fall. There you go. So that's that. That's what depression feels like. And then it's gone. Poof. And you know what can help depression be gone is thought. And I was thinking about this today uh, when I'd gone for my walk. I was thinking thoughts are so powerful. We spend so much time in our world focusing on objects and how to acquire objects and that they are going to make us powerful and things that we can eat. There's a lot of talk of like, what do you eat? Well, what do you put in your body? And yet more powerful than anything is our thought. And if you doubt that, just think, well, for one, everything you see around you in this world started out as a thought. It was somebody's thought. Oh, let's put four pieces of wood on this piece of wood we sat on on the floor and boom, it's a chair. And now we have chairs and everything is designed and design and creation comes from thought. And another illustration of the power of thought is if you imagine, I need a drink, hold on, not an alcoholic drink, not that I would say no to that, but hang on, I need literally, it's boiling hot in my room right now. Oh, okay. Oh, this is going to make so many bumps. It's going to drive, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cut some of these bumps out. I think I'll see, I'll see. Oh, there you go. There's a bit of ASMR for you. Here's my fizzy drink. It's soda stream. Because of the pandemic, I got myself a soda stream so that I wouldn't have to go out and buy fizzy drinks. I can just make my own. Here's a bit more fizz. Hang on. Did you hear that? There's some nice fizzy bubbles there. That's what we're like in this world. That's how fast time really goes. That's a whole lifetime there is one bubble going up. Like in my experience when I said it was like an equalizer of a song and you can have a whole civilization that's just one bit of a point that's one of those equalizer points in the whole song. But I digress back to thoughts. So thoughts change everything in your body by chemistry and hormones. And a simple example of that is imagine for, for one second that somebody said to you, you've won a million dollars. We, we entered your name into a secret raffle in the neighborhood. And we're just uh, announcing it now. Ryan Seacrest did a raffle and he's going to give someone a million dollars and you're it. You are the surprise person who got a million dollars and they might even have a little briefcase of cash and open it up for you. But just the thought, and you might not be a money person. I mean, a lot of people probably like the idea of a million dollars, but other powerful things is imagine 
all of the animals in the world. Somebody's just sol solved how to protect all animals in the world and there'll be no more killing of any animals in the world. You know, maybe that's your cup of tea or every child in the world is just going to get the most amazing education right now. Every single child in the world will get an education. And str straight away, you know, I, f I feel my own body chemistry changing. Just thinking of these positive things. Well, that chemistry is powerful stuff because that's what's making you operate because all those chemicals are pumping through your brain and pumping around your heart, but in particular your brain, which is like a map. I like the map analogy with the brain because it works well for a lot of things, including how to explain to people about depression and trauma. So for example, with trauma now, I have PTSD. So any sounds, my brain has built a super highway that if I hear sound, it thinks that I'm in immediate peril. So all the chemicals from something as simple as watching a DIY show on television, a door will open or, or make a little sound and I'll, I'll jolt, I'll physically jolt because my brain has a super highway right now that, ah, oh, a noise must mean peril. So, and depression, the same thing, uh, disappointments, anything that affects humans, uh, which is a lot. We're such fragile, we're fragile fuckers. Human beings are fragile fuckers. And if you don't realize that, then you're too, too lucky. You have not experienced enough trauma because trauma makes you realize that we are fragile fuckers. Disappointment, you know, that feeling of expecting something and it doesn't happen. And different gradients of that can be as simple as waiting for something in the mail and it doesn't show up. Or it can be you've proposed to somebody for marriage and, and they said no and you didn't expect it or you just got fired. You went to work and you thought you'd work more years in this company or this job and you're fired and disappointment screws up your chemicals straight away. Um, and that's our thoughts though, that, that build the playground for those disastrous events like disappointment and let down to play in. The playground is built by us, by our expectations. So we naturally think, oh, I'm going to go to work today and I'll probably do, be doing this for many years. We, we don't ever sort of casually think, well, I'm grateful that I have a job today because I don't know how long this is going to last. Most of us don't think that way. You know, um, it would probably be a very healthy thing if we did because expectation is the root of so much pain. When you think about it, heartbreak. Why have you got heartbreak? You have heartbreak because you thought it was going to work out and part of your imagination built a world where you saw yourself in the future with someone and then poof, it doesn't work and you're devastated and life is traumatized. Life seems unbearable and heartbreak is just one thing. The death of someone, you know, the death of a loved one is devastating, you know, and in no matter, some people might experience loss unexpectedly with an accident or it could be an illness and then you, you hope and your imagination hopes the person is going to get better. And we just never know. And sometimes they do. And we call that a miracle because it went that way. And I think miracles happen. I think miracles can happen. But we're so much more responsible for our mental well-being than we realize. Because it all starts with thought. Thoughts are the playground that the events play out on in your life. And expectation is the sneaky trip rope that someone, some naughty kid strung up on the playground so that you're merrily going along and then you trip. That's what expectation does. Does it mean you can't expect anything? No, of course not, because we're sort of logical people and we're natural born storytellers, human beings for as long 
as we have been on this planet. There are drawings in caves that cave dwellers made that depicted stories of hunts and, and people dying. And, you know, this is, this is how we operate. Human beings' minds look for how things are going to unfold. And that's why we're natural storytellers. And that's why we build expectation because our brain is desperate to make a pattern. There are scientific little fun things you can do with your brain. There's been TV shows about them where if you look at a bunch of dots, they'll take out some of the dots and your brain, you'll stare at the picture, your brain will put dots in where those dots aren't because your brain is made to create a predictable pattern. That is what your brain seeks to do. It might be time for another shitty poem. I have, an, I have one that I quite like, actually. I wrote pretty recently, um, and I think I'm going to read that to you. This will be the first time ever that there's been two poems in the podcast. Okay, hold on. I quite like this one. Did I mention that? And, you know, this poem I think is appropriate because today, because of listening to Jessa, it just really reminded me because we have this thing in common with the near-death experience. It really reminded me what a special experience that was that I had. I can only talk about my experience, not hers. Mine was extraordinarily sci-fi and it came with deep, profound insights into how everything worked. I saw this infinite grid of energy balls in front of me. And I had last night in bed so much anxiety and so much fear. The only thing I could do to calm my body and to stop the cortisol cranking out into my body was I pictured myself in that same energy grid that I was in on February 23rd, 2012, when I had my near-death experience. And it instantly calmed me because I felt safe, secure when that experience happened in that environment. I felt I was in the place of truth and I just was. And it was just the most beautiful, safe feeling. So I had to imagine that again, the power of thought. I just had to think think about that environment and my body naturally followed suit and I started to feel calm and relaxed and soothed. So here's, here's uh, shitty poem number two for today. I wrote this on a plane flight on the way back from a comedy gig. All right. I am the place that is in between. I am the space where no one has been. I am the race that they think I am. I am the face that's on Instagram. But underneath the bold facade is a different tale, one that's barred like a prisoner in a tiny cell, like a frozen nightmare in a living hell. It's the real me that's trapped inside in a frozen state, apocalyptic bride of the knowledge that they buried deep in a burning pyre that put us all to sleep. They were scared what would happen if we knew the truth, so they made us extinct like the saber tooth. But in darkness and in solitude is the rising of a tiny clue that something isn't what it seems, a spark of reality we think are dreams, but they're the threads of the fabric of the other side, the strands of the fibres from before we died. And the creatures roam in between the worlds like orchestral eagles as our lives unfurl and their wings spread wide amidst the woolen clouds. But they're the free ones because they have no shrouds. And then again they soar to newer heights. They see the in-between of the days and nights. They see the shadows that are made of light. And they see the love that underpins a fight. And they see the color between black and white because they are us and we are the sight of the ever-present force that they spoke about. In the books of eternity, the words they would shout, yes, we are the vision for that which exists 
in the in-between, arm and hand, we're the wrist that enables the experience with all of its drama, all the tears and the laughter, all the quiet and the clamor of the hooves that stampede to drown out our busy minds like the aircraft engines as they try to fly behind the ethereal eagles that weave and bind our dimensions together, giving sight to the blind, them and us, but it's all a sham, because they are us, you are me, and me, I am. There you go, it's a shitty poem bonanza today on The Grey Escape. Well, maybe this will be a special little short episode and then this will be kind of low pressure for me. Um, I'm already, see, in my head, in my PTSD brain, I'm thinking, oh, there's going to be so many sound problems in this podcast. I feel all that anxiety and uh, chemicals and the cortisol (laughs) engulfing me. Uh, But you know what's great? Laughter is phenomenal. And laughing about trauma is just absolutely fantastic. And I even have started to um, host a little support uh, group via Zoom for people that experience the same uh, trauma as me. And we managed to laugh. And there's nothing that's so healing than laughing at your trauma. That is a real sign that you're making progress. If you can crack jokes about the nightmare of your trauma, that's progress. I feel like after having two shitty poems on the show and calling us fragile fuckers, which I definitely fully endorse. And if I had a a stamp now and a logo, I would make a wax seal and stamp that shit. Fragile fuckers. That should be the name of this podcast. Um, but I feel I should end on something sort of all-knowing and, and insightful for you guys. But I am so winging it. And I'm like a spiral right now of, of life and making the best effort to try and not fall down and trip on that little piece of string in the playground. So I'm just taking it like day by day, which is not a bad plan, if I'm honest, Um, during this life and this world. It's not a bad plan to kind of go moment by moment. So right now, I think I'm going to wrap up this podcast. Uh, I I feel kind of really sweaty, (laughs) not to be gross. But it's boiling hot in the room that I am in because I switched off the AC because my perfectionist PTSD brain didn't want to have any sound of air coming into the room. This is where my well-being sits in relationship to this podcast. Is it, it was more important that you guys get better audio quality than I be able to breathe. So on that, I just... I'm going to say that I genuinely hope you guys are doing well. I hope you're doing better than me and you don't have trauma and stress and and awful chemistry that's trying to make you want to stay under a weighted blanket all day, which frankly is also great. Weighted blanket, well worth 50 bucks on Amazon, right, if you're traumatized. Um, Thank you guys for listening to this unusual episode. Uh, (laughs) Feel free to write to me. I love hearing from you guys. My favorite thing in the world, as I've mentioned before, is a review on iTunes and a rating. That just uh, will spark all the good chemicals in my brain. It will be, you see, now I'm already setting myself up for an expectation that one of you is going to write a review and, and put like the star rating. One moment at a time, Natalie. Nobody may rate your podcast. Nobody. Okay. Well, I'm thinking about all of you guys because we're all in this together. Never in my lifetime has that been a more true sentiment than right now. So wherever you are in the world, hang tight. We're going to get through this. Go buy a weighted blanket. 
Oh, see, I can't even wrap up. Oh. You know what's a really great way to wrap up with people who suffer from any kind of tra- trauma or depression uh, is you don't say goodbye because th- those are really traumatic words or word to hear. You say, well, till next time or I'll see you later, or I'll talk to you soon. So, guys, I'll be back soon, right here on The Grey Escape. No, I didn't even end there, you see. Perfectionist brains, like, that was a shittier ending than any poem you will ever write. But I'm going to end the podcast now. Fuck me, I still didn't end. 